that was so painful and confusing that all you wanted to do was learn as much as you could to make sense of it all? When I was 13, a close family friend, who was like an uncle to me, passed from pancreatic cancer. When the disease hit so close to home, I knew I needed to learn more. So I went online to find answers. And using the internet, I found a variety of statistics on pancreatic cancer. And what I had found shocked me. Over 85% of all pancreatic cancers are diagnosed late. When someone has less than a 2% chance of survival, why are we so bad at detecting pancreatic cancer? The reason? Our current modern medicine is a 60-year-old technique. I mean, that's older than my dad. But also, it costs $800 per tax and is grossly inaccurate, missing 30% of all pancreatic cancers. Your doctor would have to be ridiculously suspicious that you have the cancer in order to give you this tax. Learning this, I was sure there had to be a better way. So, I set up a scientific criteria as to what a sensor would have to look like. A sensor that would functionally detect pancreatic cancer would have to be... Come on, there we go. Inexpensive, rapid, simple, sensitive, selective, and minimally invasive. And there's a reason why this test hasn't been updated in over six decades. And that's because when we're looking for pancreatic cancer, we're looking in your bloodstream for a protein that's found at a higher level. And while this sounds very straightforward, it's anything but. Essentially, you're looking for this tiny increase in this tiny amount of protein in this vast liters and liters of, of, of blood that's already abundant in this protein. It's almost as worse as detecting a, a needle in a sack of nearly identical needles. However, undeterred due to my teenage optimism, I went online to any teenager's best friends for information. Google and Wikipedia, how to get through every high school test. And essentially I found a database of over 8,000 different proteins online that are found in your blood when you have pancreatic cancer. And I decided I'm just going to go plug and chug through all 8,000 proteins to decide which one will be the best. And I actually did that. It was a pretty insane idea. And on the 4,000th try, when I was close to losing my sanity, I finally found a protein that might just work. Its name was mesothelium, and it's just your ordinary run the mill type protein, unless you have pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer, in which case it's found these very high levels in your bloodstream. But in addition, the key is that's around the earliest stages of the disease, when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. So, now that I found a reliable protein to detect, I then shifted my focus to actually detecting that protein and thus pancreatic cancer. And my breakthrough actually came in the most unlikely of places, my high school biology class, the absolute stifler of innovation. <coughs> and essentially I had snuck in this article on single walled carbon nanotubes, essentially long thin types of carbon that are at a thick and 150,000 of the dairy in your hair. Yet despite their small size, they have these incredible properties. They're kind of like the superheroes of material science. So while I was sneakily reading this article under my desk in my biology class, <coughs> we were learning about these things called antibodies. And antibodies are really, really cool. They essentially are molecules that only react with one specific protein, in this case a cancer biomarker. And then I was just sitting in biology class when suddenly it hit me. When I was reading about carbon nanotubes, and what I was supposed to be thinking about antibodies could be combined. Essentially, you take these antibodies and weave them into this network of carbon nanotubes, such that you have a network that only reacts with one specific protein. But in addition, due to the properties of carbon nanotubes, this network of cool actually changes electrical properties based on the amount of protein present, and thus potentially detect pancreatic cancer. However, there's a catch. These networks of carbon nanotubes are extremely flimsy, and since they're so delicate, they need to be supported. So that's why I chose to use paper. And making a paper sensor at, for, for pancreatic cancer out of paper is about as simple as making chocolate chip cookies, which I love. <laughs> Essentially, you start with some water, you pour in the nanotubes, add some antibodies, mix it up, then you take some paper, dip it, dry it, and you can detect cancer. <laughs> However, suddenly I realized I might need a lab to do this cancer research. I might not like, I mean, my mom had put up with a lot. Like, I cultured E. coli I work, and I make my sandwiches, and we make explosives in our basement. So, she put up with a lot, but cancer research, not quite. So, okay. I then went, and I 
need the staff to identify you know, two hundred different professors at Johns Hopkins University and the National Institute of Health, asking essentially anyone that had anything to do with pancreatic cancer if I could go work in their lab. I set them a budget, a um, uh, procedure, a timeline, the whole deal. And I waited and waited, like I was super hopeful, I was going to get like all these positive responses, I'm going to be able to pick and choose my lab. Then reality took hold. I got 199 rejections out of those 200 emails I sent. And some of the professors were very mean. They, they were nasty in those emails. They, they went through my entire procedure and said why well, each and every step was wrong. But I learned here some professors aren't nearly as nice as their pictures make them seem to be. <laughs> However, there's one professor that finally accepted me, Dr. Annabelle Maitra of Johns Hopkins University. And he said, oh, maybe I might be able to help you, kid. So I come in three months later, armed with these giant stacks of three ring binders, stuffed with 500 plus journal articles. I go in, sit down, all excited, my heart's pounding. And then he starts, like, just firing these questions at me. And then he's, like, out of the corner of his eye, he glances like a PhD walking by. He's like, you get in here. And then, like, more coming by. Like, once he gathers a sizable posse, the interrogation can start. And they just start firing these questions at me, like trying to sink my procedure. And I eventually got through it. I guessed on a lot of those questions, but luckily I got them all right. I guess C on everything, like I do on my SATs. <laughs> and then I landed the lab space I needed. And as soon as I began work, I realized how much experience I need in a lab. Like, for example, I tripped and like threw my cells all over the lab, and then I sneezed in my cells, and then I blew them up in the centrifuge, and then I couldn't get this one Western blot assay to work. I, I was, the, those first like few months were, were pretty, oh, those were a hot mess. But <laughs> eventually, after seven months of hard work, of trial and error in the lab, I finally got one small paper sensor that costs three cents and takes five minutes to run. This makes it 168 times faster over 26,000 times less expensive, and over 400 times more sensitive than our current standard to pancreatic cancer detection. But the best part is, is that it's 100% accurate, and can detect the cancer in the earliest stages, when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. So in the next two to five years, this patent-pending sensor could potentially lift the once dismal pancreatic cancer survival rate from 5.5% up to close to 100%, and would do similar for ovarian and lung cancer. But it wouldn't stop there. By switching out this antibody, which is pretty simple, you can detect a different protein, and thus a different disease. Potentially any of these diseases in the entire world, ranging from Alzheimer's to heart disease, other forms of cancer, even HIV AIDS. And so my hope for this sensor is that one day we can all have those extra few moments with that one uncle, that one close family friend, that one brother, sister, relative. So that's what my really big hope. And but now I'm starting to realize how much I hate antibodies. <laughs> antibodies are the worst thing ever. They are fickle. They don't like being produced. Like they're they're terrible. So now what I'm working on is something called a Raman spectrometer. Essentially, you shoot some light at a concentrated beam of light at something. And essentially what will happen is based on that interaction with the light, it will essentially tell me the exact chemical composition of that sample. And the unfortunate thing is that these cost $100,000 and the size of a car. And so they're not really applicable for anything. They kind of just like sit in the lab and no one really goes near them since they're kind of fragile. And so what I'm working on is creating one that's about the size of a sugar cube and will cost only a few dollars. And it would have important applications, for example, in detecting cancer and diseases, medical diagnostics, environmental monitoring, and even explosive detection, and much, much more. And this is all part of the project for the Qualcomm, oh, whoops, okay, we're going to be jumping around here, slide jumping. This is all towards this one big prize called the Qualcomm Foundation Tri-Quarter X Prize for $10 million. And essentially what it is, is it's developed something inside of a smartphone that you pass over your skin and diagnose anything instantaneously. And now, all the other teams for this are groups of adults and large corporations. So I decided to be the rebel, the rebel, rebel, one of those words. And 
I decided to do it with a team of all high school students. So I gathered all my friends together from Utah ISAC, and I was just like, hey, do you want to do this? Some of them were like, you're crazy, man. What are you talking about? <laughs> and then some of them were like, oh, yeah, yeah, let's do this. So it's a large spectrum. But uh, I finally gathered a team, and so now we're going to be working at MIT, and so working towards the Qualcomm tricorder. And that's what's really the future, and so I'm really excited about that. However, back to this slide. Through this, I've learned a very important lesson. And that is, with the internet, anything is possible. Theories can be shared, and you don't have to be a professor with multiple degrees to have your ideas valued. It's a neutral space. For what you look like, age, or gender, it doesn't matter. It's just your ideas that count. So instead of taking pictures of your food and posting them on Instagram, for example, you can be changing the world. I mean, I'm a 15-year-old. I barely knew what pancreatic cancer was. I didn't even know I had a pancreas at the beginning of this thing. <laughs> so a 15-year-old who doesn't know if he had a pancreas could find a new way to detect pancreatic cancer. Just imagine what you could do. Thank you.